Welcome to Library Land Conversations, a chance for us to hear from members of the library community to learn what's going on in Library Land. I'm Greg Peveril Conti, the Executive Director of the Library Land Project, and these conversations are uh, in some ways the only way we're able to stay connected to the library community, and they're, they're really important to both Adam and I. Thank you, Greg. Uh, I am Adam Zand. I'm President of the Library Land Project. We met today's guest back in February when we were all on the agenda for the Library Journal Winter Summit, which was a great event. It was virtual, of course, uh, so we weren't actually able to sit down or, or meet anyone, um, but today's guest really stood out. Rebecca Smith Aldridge gave the opening presentation at the event, and it was a highlight for me. Uh, Rebecca is currently executive director of the Mid-Hudson Library System, which is a six, uh, 66 member Public Library Consortium in New York State. She's the author of Sustainable Thinking, uh, Ensuring Your Library's Future in an Uncertain World, and another book, Resilience, and lots of other uh, articles and, and books that maybe we'll hear about later. Rebecca is a frequent international speaker, as we mentioned, and she looks at practical ways to ensure that libraries are relevant and responsive to those that they serve. She's co-founder of the Sustainable Libraries Initiative and the award-winning Sustainable Library Certification Program. And today we're going to talk about resilience and the opportunities for libraries as we think about coming out of this pandemic. We'll learn about sustainability uh, in, in a few different ways in libraries and get Rebecca's thoughts on the legislative agenda to support libraries moving forward. Adam? <clears throat> and thanks, Rebecca, for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. Um, you know, your bio talks about uh, the sustainable building work. Um, the work you've done with LEAD, and that's for those of you learning at home, Leadership in Environmental, uh, Energy and Environmental Design, LEAD, um, and your MLS. How did that progress, how did you get from where you were to where you are now? How did your studies uh, bring you to where you are? And, and how do you think about sustainability? And how did that interest grow? So I um, grew up in a home that was very much embedded in um, environmental conscientiousness, although it was never said that's what we were doing. Um, I just, that's just the way I grew up. And that's what I understood the way to live your life. And as I became an adult and got out into the wider world, I started to recognize that there was intersections that weren't evident in other parts of my life as I had grown up with. So like a really funny example is, you know, we had a school assignment, like in the fourth grade to demonstrate some way you were, uh, environmentally conscientious at home. And I asked my dad, like, do we have an example of that? Cause I just, it wasn't standing out to me. He's like, oh yeah, we've got a brick in the tank of the toilet. So we use less water. And I was like, oh, who would have guessed that? Right. And uh, in, you know, as I told my that story. That. Yeah. yeah, I think that was a start yeah. for a lot of us. <laughs> so, you know, as I started getting more responsibility at the, the library system where I've worked for about 20 years, I became uh, the administrator for the state aid for library construction program, which is a very bureaucratic program and really overwhelming for smaller libraries in my system. But I always kind of had it in my head. Why aren't libraries choosing to build greener buildings and use less energy? And wouldn't libraries be a perfect demonstration place for this kind of technology? Because so many people come to the building and could understand better why you make those choices. And so very naively, I'd go into library board meetings and be like, oh, yeah, you should use this lead certification program and like build a, a healthier building for your library workers and patrons and like, well, that costs more. So we're not doing that. And I'd be really stymied. I'd be like, oh, is that true? Like, I don't think it's true. And so I went all in and I like learned everything I could about it. And I actually became certified. I'm accredited professional now in, in that certification program and learned about as many as I could. I've read everything under the sun about it so I can make a better case to library boards. It, it does not have to cost more if you do it right. If you think about it early um, and you tell your architect that's what you're looking for, you seek out architects that specialize in that, it does not cost any more than regular construction. And you get all of these benefits. So yeah. 
and it costs I'm, less. It can cost less, and especially in the over long time. term. Yeah, exactly. Yep. yep. So it impacts your overall operating costs, which tied into the other end of my work at the time for the library system, which was in New York. We have basically referendum on library budgets. So every year our libraries have to prove if they're worthy of investment or not. People have to vote to tax themselves more for library services. So a big part of my job was helping libraries make that case. Like, are you worthy of investment? Are you producing good results? Are you make, making good use of the money they've already entrusted to you? And how are you going to prove that? And so it all just started to fit together nicely that if we made better decisions with the money that had been entrusted us, both in terms of how we design services and programs, but also how we make decisions about very large things like facilities, which have a very big footprint, which make a very big impression. So my mantra kind of became that, you know, not every bit of storytelling is verbal, that sometimes you're making these nonverbal choices that do tell a story about your value set and where you invest money and what you care about. And if what you care about is the people that you serve, the people who work in your libraries, you should be making better choices about the built environment. So that all kind of started mushing together um, for me there for about 10 years. And then I um, started going to conferences outside of the library industry, um, which I know you two are very uh, good at kind of cross-pollinating your understanding of the world. And I ended up at the U.S. Green Building Council's um, Green Build Conference with a colleague of mine, Matt Ballerman, down at the Hop Hog Public Library on Long Island. Mm -hmm. Um, At the time, though, he had just built a LEED certified building. So we were very rare people in New York who understood what LEED was. And on the train ride home from Philadelphia, we started talking about why aren't libraries seen as leaders on the topic of sustainability? We're perfectly positioned for it. We're like the grandmothers and grandfathers of the sharing economy. Uh, We're really smart people. We've got access to all the world's wisdom on our shelves and our databases. We should be making far better decisions than we are. What year was that? Uh, Matt Ballerman. No, no. What what year? Oh, that was in 2012. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, so it was a while ago now, I guess we're nine years out from that. Um, But that started us on this whole huge journey where we went to our colleagues at the New York Library Association, we found like-minded people, we built the Sustainability Library uh, Initiative, and now a certification program. And it's just really opened up people's eyes to who libraries want to be in the future. How's the uptake on that certification? So we pilot it here in New York. We have a product for public libraries, academic libraries, and then school librarians. Um, So we have about, I think, two dozen public libraries in New York piloting it with five who have been certified. We just certified the first school librarian uh, and we're walking towards going national with it later this year. So we've got a waiting list um, and we've got about 600 people on our newsletter list who have just kind of been interested in what we're up to. So we've, we've got big hopes for it. That's awesome. We'll definitely add a link so people can add themselves to your list at the end of this broadcast. Thank you. Uh, that is great. I, I, I want to take a, a little bit wider look at sustainability. And I'm thinking back to your library journal presentation that I mentioned. And you talked about the unprecedented times where we were going through and still going through with pandemic and renewed focus on racial injustice and gender inequality, um, poverty, food insecurity, digital inequality, uh, access to quality education and, and lots of other needs. And you pointed out, uh, and I I thought it was encouraging, that urgency drives change. And I I guess I'm I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about sustainable thinking and how that encompasses not just the environment, which we've touched on a little bit, but also economics and social equity as well. Yeah. Well, I found that when I first started talking about going green as it was lovingly called you know a decade ago if people really uh, siloed it into like earth day and checklists about recycling and i just found i needed to to help people think bigger about it and the truth is the idea of what's going on in the the environment the ecosystem it's really overwhelming for people once you start recognizing that well this is happening because of all of this other stuff and it's all connected and then people start freaking out because like where do you even start like where do you even start start with the idea of turning climate change around or, you know, you know, dealing with the super storms that we're now starting to see with that increased frequency and, and intensity thanks to climate change. So we needed to find a cleaner way or frameworks to talk about it, to start making it more, I think, 
accessible for people. Um, so we adopted what we call the triple bottom line definition of sustainability, which is out of the business world. Um, but it, it notes that you need to find balance amongst three things, uh, not just environmental stewardship, but economic feasibility and, and social equity. Because without all three of those things in balance, we're out of whack and things just start going haywire. And you can apply that thinking to a product. Um, so we always use the example of like summer reading program incentives that we like to give to kids to recognize you know, how much they've been reading in the summer. And sometimes when you look at the crap libraries buy, uh, it's because it was cheap, right? But it ends up in the landfill pretty quickly because parents are tired of stepping on it all summer. Um, and then when you start to look at who, who made that item, where they paid a living wage, what natural resources went into it, your mind like is like, whoa, you know? So can we make better decisions of items we buy, buildings we build, communities that we build? And so this uh, framework really scales well, regardless of size of library, size of community, type of library, uh, and it's made it far more, I think, approachable for people to understand what we're talking about. Um, so I always think, I don't know if you heard me say this before, of the quote from John Muir, uh, the conservationist who was really the, the grandfather of our national park system, and he said, whenever you pull on one little thread in the unit, you, you find it connected to everything in the universe. And so again, we have to find ways to make it doable for people, which is why we created the certification program was to say, here's this huge idea. You have the capacity to be a leader. Here's a methodology for how you're gonna go about it. Interesting. You know, you, you said uh, that, you know, people think of green and associated with Earth Day. And I think there's a sustainability message in the way we think, uh, you know, if, if April is green for Earth Day and February is black for Black History Month and we have banned book week and that's when we think about freedom of speech, it's like those things need to be sustainable themselves. They can't just be siloed into a week, a day, a month. And I think that kind of sustainable thinking is also, I think it's probably pretty important. Well, that's the idea behind the, we define sustainable thinking as really aligning our core values and resources with the local and global community's right to thrive. So that's a mindset. That's a way of thinking. That's a lens through which you look through every single day for every single decision. And that's no small lift, right? To get people to think differently in that new way, but it's the only way forward. It's the only way to, to have that kind of bold thinking, the massive shift in the economy that needs to happen to truly make a difference and honestly save people's lives. When you look at what's happening with climate change, not only rising sea levels, but the intensity of storms that we're seeing, you're seeing increased economic and human life uh, loss uh, during these storms. We, we literally are talking about people's lives. Um, so libraries ability, and I know uh, I'd like to talk more about this maybe a little later too, but it really does boil down to social cohesion and how well people have empathy for one another, um, regardless of what their background is and, and where what their culture is. That's actually the core of everything that we talk about, which is that if you can't work together with your neighbors, we're not going to get very far at all. You know, <clears throat> that, that's terrific to hear because, I mean, you know, one of the things that Adam and I so value when we visit libraries is that sense that this is a part of the community, that this is an essential element of this community's life. And the more that we can reinforce that centrality and that essential nature for, for everyone, not just uh, you know, specific community members, I, I, the better off we all are. And I mean, these are the single, single uh, civic institution that's available equally to all. Right. And uh, as you said, why not be a showcase for sustainable thinking? Why not be a showcase for what we can be? I mean, that's what makes libraries so special. And often, often we are that, but we're not known for that. So that's the other part of this is the PR angle of it is, is helping library leaders talk about who we are and what we do perhaps in a bit of a different way to stop being so chronically humble and like get out there and brag about the connectivity we are able to create, not only from a technology and knowledge standpoint, but with neighbors um, to bring people together in ways they never would have otherwise gotten a chance to connect. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, libraries do have a PR problem. I mean, that's one of the things that Adam and I talk about a lot. It's, yeah. it's great to promote programs. Uh, like that's super important, but it's, is more important to it, it explain that idea yeah. uh, that, that matters. Um, let, let's switch gears a little bit uh, because I know uh, we're, we're actually in infrastructure week. Is that right, Adam? This, yeah, this you, is... United for infrastructure week is, is the, <laughs> and this the can't buzzword be the only for week. this week. <laughs> Um, but you know, at the end, in late March, uh, President Biden 
shared his infrastructure plan and there was nary a word about public libraries. Uh, given that it's United for Infrastructure Week, um, can you talk about Build America's Library Act? I mean, we, yeah. we talked to some folks in the, in the in Congress about it earlier this year, but we'd love to hear what you're thinking about and how that's gonna impact library workers and patrons and policymakers and how to get those people all aligned. Um, yeah, so I had the same moment where I searched that bill for libraries and it was like, <laughs> come on. <laughs> It's Again, like, am I misspelling it? I know. Uh, so I, the Build America's Libraries Act is really uh, groundbreaking. It's really a once in a lifetime opportunity for the library community to see federal investment in library infrastructure like we've never seen before. We're talking about five billion dollars put into what the Institute of Museum and Library Services has uh, created a whole new acronym for that I had never heard of before, uh, which is HASTER, uh, which is Health, Accessibility, Technology, Safety, Environmental Impact, and Resilience in the Face of Natural Disaster. So we are talking about the gamut of things that library facilities are struggling with right now. Um, you know, in my system, the number one thing we're always focused on is accessibility. As we see people wanting to age in place uh, in upstate New York, are we actually going to have facilities that meet their needs? We have aging infrastructure in terms of electrical grids and electrical wiring in libraries. We have a lot of historic buildings in my area. Um, so, you know, there's so much need out there. I have over 30 million dollars in need in my own system and our state doles out you know just these teeny bits of money mm -hmm. uh, every year to really it doesn't just it doesn't cut it um so we're talking about over 200 million dollars in my state in new york alone which is just game changing for all of us and i think it's very interesting to see that environmental impact and resilience is built into that bill that they want libraries thinking about a sustainable future a more resilient future to make library facilities a go-to place in the face of what we are now seeing happen right we just saw in texas extended electrical outages uh extended power outages with no uh, heat and water in some cases we're seeing storms that are knocking out parts of communities and people are desperate to connect and not only with each other and with federal assistance, but with technology perhaps to keep working during that time. Um, so library facilities are starting to be, I think, grown from this idea of a kind of quaint anchor institution to being classified as one of the buildings that should be restored first by FEMA in the face of a, a storm and to start building buildings more smartly, that we've got buildings that understand like more crap is coming and we've got to prepare those buildings for them. So building them with, you know, high levels of insulation, uh, passive uh, design. So they're not reliant on electricity uh, as much as they are today, you know, using renewable energy. So you're not reliant on the grid, uh, creating little micro grids is my little dream to see libraries uh, kind of, uh, I think, creating the hub of microgrids. So it's a really exciting amount of money, but there's a lot of advocacy work to be done to see that happen. So right now we're very focused on uh, getting as many Congress people to sign on to that as possible. We're doing full court press until Memorial Day. We want, uh, particularly in our state, we need Senator Schumer to hear about libraries every single day. Um, and that's what we're working on. But I think also anyone can be, you know, posting on social media about their library story, tagging their legislators so that the raising the profile of need in districts that Congress people serve. Libraries are normally seen as nonpartisan and a very uh, smart place to invest money, um, but we obviously have to work harder because we didn't get put into the infrastructure bill. So as usual, libraries are, you know, small but mighty when it comes to advocacy <laughs> and, and ALA is doing a nice job leading the charge. Excellent. Yeah. Are, are you encouraged overall or, you know, what, what, what are you sort of feeling about the chances for the act or, you know, the, the inevitable compromises that sort of develop out of these? It's, there's momentum there. I, from what I've seen, you know, I attend any webinar ALA advocacy office staff does to understand what they're seeing on the ground. Uh, the conversations we've had with our own Congress people are very positive. They're happy to sign on to it and, and also do the legwork to see if it could be included in the infrastructure bill. So it's not a hard sell. Normally when we go in on these kinds of things, it's a non-starter, like, well, we've got too many competing uh, interests right now, but so far so good. But I just think it's such a time of hope um, where we're seeing forward motion and investment in the right places in our country again, um, that I still have hope for it, um, but you never know. You know, Washington's a tough place and not always one that uh, comes down on the side of common sense. So. Sadly not. Yes. <laughs> well, we'll be watching and doing what we can, obviously, on our, our oh. channels. Um, it, you mentioned PR earlier in communications, and uh, I'm wondering specifically, how do you think libraries should be thinking about uh, communication and sort of re-engaging with their communities as we think about coming out of the pandemic. 
And we just uh, did a workshop for our member library directors about two weeks ago. And it was very funny because my colleague and I, Casey, we got in an argument over what we should call the workshop. Because I said, we should call it writing your library's comeback story. And he quoted LL Cool J and said, don't call it a comeback. We've been here the whole time. Yeah. Right? We, didn't, we were yeah. providing services the whole time. The yeah. problem is people you know, were so distracted, they might not have realized it. So I think right now is a big message of we're here and hey, we never went anywhere, but we've got to get reconnected with people. The drop off in door count forced by social distancing and stay at home orders really artificially, I think, uh, forced a decline in the number of people interacting with our libraries. And we certainly, you know, we, you know, issued about 20,000 new library cards during the pandemic. That needs to be translated into, you know, services that people are coming through the door for, getting people to program. So we're really encouraging our libraries to have a strong PR plan that's specific to the next six months to let people know we're here, uh, that we never really went anywhere. We need to tell the story of what we've been doing during the pandemic, really focusing on issues of equity, uh, equity of access to broadband technology, uh, to device technology and vaccine equity, how we helped people get the vaccine and, and understand what the vaccine would mean for people. So we want our libraries to be really methodical and not just leave it to chance. Like, oh, they'll come back. Like, I just don't think we should assume that. We've got to reconnect with people who have found workarounds, other solutions, think they can kind of live without it. We need to remind them what an important asset the library is to the community and create high visibility events too, which we're a little gun shy about right now because of social distancing, but we do have to reconnect our community through our libraries. And that's going to take deliberate effort. This is like, unfortunately something that we hear again and again like there is just so much concern that people have fallen out of the library habit that digital services curbside are meeting the needs and uh you know how do we especially when we need that cohesion more than ever how do we make sure that we don't don't shortchange this this huge resource for for cohesion I think we're going to, we're going to, I feel like my libraries did a great job during the pandemic. They found ways to connect with neighbors, either by giving them a call, wellness calls, how you doing, creating online events for people to meet, using outdoor space in new and creative ways. Um, so it's just, you know, that energy that libraries need to bring to those interactions to re-engage with people. And it's all about word of mouth. I think as the story gets told of what an amazing job libraries did during the pandemic, that helps want people to come and see, well, what are they doing now? And I didn't know they had that. You know, those are the kinds of questions we need people asking about libraries. And it's really about the energy we put out in the universe. Absolutely. Um, are, are there any examples of, uh, you know, sort of that resilience and creativity in your, your own system? Oh, yeah. I felt like every week we were seeing libraries come up with new and creative uh, ways to connect with people. We saw a lot of outdoor uh, events, story walks all in really creative places. We saw libraries deploying Wi-Fi networks off site. So uh, one of my libraries deployed a Wi-Fi network in the rec park and partnered with the town to get more picnic tables so families could do homework out there. Uh, oh, name all names. Sorts like sing the praises of specific libraries. They sure, that's the Red Hook Public Library uh, awesome. in Dutchess County did the Wi-Fi deployed Wi-Fi Wi-Fi network. Uh, the Kinderhook Library in Columbia County has been doing a series of uh, story walks. I just saw their most recent one that focused on a book with baby owls. Who doesn't like baby owls? And then there's a little box at the end. There's a coupon for the local ice cream place. Um, so I think that connection with local businesses who really struggled as well. Libraries were seen as the um, kind of town crier to help people connect um, with new ways people were doing business as well. So we saw the Phoenicia Library out in Ulster County. They started delivering groceries uh, along Wow. with books to people and uh, really, really focused on food scarcity in the Catskill Mountains. So they took on some new roles. They helped support businesses. They just continuously amaze me. And I'm just really proud of the work they do. It's just wonderful to be a member uh, of the system and, and work alongside such creative people. That's so awesome. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that, you know, people talk about libraries sometimes in an abstract way. Um, and I, we love naming libraries and saying like, well, these places are, doing like this specific place is doing something awesome. Well, my board challenged me at our annual meeting in October. I had to tell a little story about all 66 in the 20 minutes they gave me to wow. do my annual report. So I got stories for days, guys. <laughs> and you're, and you can be a speed reader too. It sounds like too. That's, that's impressive. Well, I, we're, we're winding down a little bit and we, we, you know, we've really enjoyed this conversation. Um, it, towards the end of these, we always sort of turn to, seminal moments, you know, how, how we fell in love with libraries. And a lot of times it, it's from our youth. I wonder if there's anything you wanted to share with us, uh, a special library memory. 
the library was such a huge part of my life growing up. We went multiple days a week. My dad was on the library board uh, of my local library, which is in my system now. So it's kind of cool to be a part of the, the history of that library. But it was literally just part of our family. Like, we went as a family. Uh, my dad defended my right to read when I wanted to read things outside of the children's room. Uh, he created a junior uh, board position for me so I could put it on my college application. Wow. He encouraged me to go to library school out of my undergraduate and I did not. Um, it's just been, it's such a connection with my parents and my brothers that it just feels like part of the fabric of our lives. And I just recognized that it created community for us um, as children, you know, it's where we networked and met kids and, uh, and where my parents were, you know, finding friends. And so it's just so ingrained and embedded in my life. It was hard for me to pick one memory. <laughs> but what, I just what, think, you know, what community was that? With, that's with Pleasant library? Valley, Pleasant Valley, yep. New York. And, and has the library changed a lot? Like, have you gone back uh, since uh, uh, renovations or complete rebuilds what what's the what's the state now well it's a pretty crazy story actually because the library uh, had an electrical fire uh in 2016 and is at currently rebuilding so they're rebuilding on the original site and expanding which is really exciting um but about a year and a half ago right before the pandemic they invited me in since i'm the, the system director now i get invited to these events and they had reopened in a donated grocery store space, temporary location, and, and they brought me in as part of a, an event to speak at the event to just thank donors and keep everyone's spirits up as they continue to raise money for the library. And uh, at the same event, they decide to reveal that a quilt, a community quilt that had been damaged in the fire had been restored. And so right before I spoke, they and they did it on purpose. They reveal the quilt, which was created by my class when I was in kindergarten. <laughs> and I had drawn a little letter in the my class's square. And it was just so emotional to recognize that tie that, you know, it's it's literally, literally the fabric of our lives is in this quilt and understanding the respect the library had for that memorabilia for the community's sake. That, and that it will be preserved and featured in the new facility. It really spoke. Great to that continuity, you know, that we feel about our libraries. That's have so you, wonderful. Have um, you, it, did you take a picture of that? Have you posted course. that anywhere? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Course. Like, or has that been in a book or will it be presentation? I don't have it in one of my books yet, but that's a good idea, Adam. I might do that. <laughs> um, so that's a, a nice memory from the past, a super memory that, uh, that brings past to present. Uh, uh, just looking back to sustainability to kind of square the circle here, is there an example of uh, a library that's really practicing awesome sustainability skills or that's been designed in a way that you're like, that's what we need to be doing? There's a growing number, but I, I have a particular affection for the Phoenicia Library, which I just mentioned a few minutes ago in Ulster County uh, and the Catskills. They, this is a little theme here. They also had a fire, uh, no, no connection at all. Um, but when they decided to build back, they actually bought my line about build back better, let's go green and uh, built the first uh, library that will be certified as passive house designed um, in the country. So it's just using smart technology and uh, construction methodology to build a, more, a better insulated building with higher air exchange, so better air quality. They're using far less fossil fuels to heat and cool the building. That library is also designed, I hope you get to visit it someday, because yeah, we do it's too. one of the first that I saw that put people first in the design in a small library, that they didn't get fo so focused on the collection that it overwhelmed people space, because it is a total gathering place in their community. So you see the collection pushed to the edges of the building. It lines the walls, but the center is preserved for meeting space for people to to commune and be a community together. So they embody both the environmental, the social equity and the economic feasibility when you see how much money they're saving. In a, in a far bigger building, they're still paying less than they did to heat that building when it was much smaller. So in my mind, they really embody the spirit of sustainable thinking and it really, the legacy came to life. Their vision for what it could be is exactly what it is, which was completely shown out during the pandemic. Awesome. Uh, that's great. Well, it's it's on our list, and uh, you know we'd like to see. I don't know if we can do all sixty six, but we'll we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll come visit you when possible. So th th thanks so much, Rebecca. I, I really enjoyed uh, listening in and talking with you and learning a lot today. So thanks. Yeah, it's been a total pleasure. Um, and then you know, do you want to share ways people can get in touch with you? Oh, absolutely. I am. Uh... 
I love talking to people about libraries. I don't know if you can tell. <laughs> <laughs> Who doesn't? I have a website at sustainablelibraries.org. I'm on Twitter at Rebecca, R-E-B-E-K-K-A-H. Facebook, Instagram, you can find me. I'm all over the place, but I love connecting with people. So thanks for the opportunity. No problem. Well, we've come to an end and I want to thank our viewers uh, for the, watching this library land conversation. And we're going to keep on doing these, talking to voices in library land. Um, we have more in store, but, but please share um, ideas and suggestions, people you'd like to have as guests. You can drop us a note at info at librarylandproject.org or comment on YouTube or Facebook and, and get in touch. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks again. Thank you. Thanks. Stop on my way.